Dan Case, talk about being very efficient with your funding that we all have so much of these days to make collaborative spaces on campus. I have to be honest, I'm really, uh, I loved uh, uh, helping orchestrate Portland last year, but one of the bummers was because I was so busy, I was not able to attend his presentation last year, which was super awesome. Um, so I'm really excited to hear, uh, Dan is one of those people, I was just telling him some minute ago, uh, he's one of those people, he's more of a risk taker than I think we are at Portland State, but he, he loves playing with the new, more innovative technology that I wish more of us were embracing. So I'm really excited to hear your presentation and take it away, Dan. All right. Thanks, Mark, I appreciate that. Am I, am I live here? Okay, cool. Um, of course, I get a support call, phone call. Okay, all right, so here we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, this new collaborative interactive low class classroom. And so um, a while back, we had the opportunity. Um, we are remodeling our library like most places are. And so we got rid of a lot of stacks in our library, opened up a lot of space. And so we had this space. And like, what are we going to do with this? So I thought, well, let's, let's try to design something from the ground up. Um, we had a donor, which was nice, too, to do something cool. So I came up with um, three guiding principles that I wanted to, to use to build a new classroom. Um, first off, it had to be easy, because um, we've all had technology inside classrooms, smart boards, whatever. You stick it in there, and then nobody uses it. Um, and, and faculty get intimidated by all this wire and this controls, and I got to push all these buttons and make things happen, and it becomes quickly overwhelming. So I'd, that was my first guiding principle. My next principle was it had to be flexible. Um, so I wanted it to be used in, in multiple different ways. So you weren't constrained to just, I've got to use a room this way. And, and it can be flexible. It can be used as a conference room. It can be used in small groups and big groups and in different seminars type. Whatever it needed to be, I wanted it to be flexible. Um, and then I also wanted it to be used even without technology. Because um, what happens is if you build this high technology room and then People don't want to go into it because it's like, well, that's a really expensive room, all high technology. I don't want to use that. I'm intimidated by it. I want it to be for anybody. So you could go in there. You could do all kinds of fun things and not even use the technology, and, and that's okay. And the last thing, it had to be cost effective. Um, there's lots of collaborative active learning spaces that have been developed around the nation. The problem is, is they're you know, $80,000, $100,000. That's way over our budget, for one thing. Um, and the second thing is, even if I built that really cool room, could I then duplicate it around campus? Because I'm, I'm going to build a $100,000 room, everyone's going to love it, and I've got all these faculty saying that's a great room. Well, now I've got to build five or six more, and I don't have $100,000 times six, not even the first. So I needed to be cost effective so I could duplicate it. Um, th this, you know, you've all seen this. This is actually one of, one of our classrooms on campus, so I can, I can criticize this all I want here. Um, <laughs> um, but this is the case that we've been doing for a long time, is we have these old classrooms that have these great, comfortable wooden chairs, um, and if you're 120 pounds and right-handed, they're ideal for you, um, and if you're not one of those things. Um, but it, it uh, and so what we did, we took these classrooms and we just stuck a projector in the ceiling and then put a screen against the wall and said, ooh, now it's a multimedia classroom, and oh, let's put a document camera on the side and it's going to be amazing. Um, and I don't think it changed anything, obviously. And so my idea was to create something that was um, flexible, that you could do all kinds of things with. You could bring technology, and you could have students collaborate. Um, and it was available all the time to do different things. So this is what we, we developed. It's called the Sandbox. Um, this is one of my classes in there doing some stuff. Um, here's another use of the Sandbox as a small group collaboration. Um, put the tables together. Uh, we do a lot of wireless technology. We'll talk about that as we move along. Um, and then here's another example of it being used in almost a kind of a uh, traditional way, um, where everybody's kind of facing one to one direction, um, but again, in, in a different type of environment. Uh, here's an example of it being used after hours um, by students. So it's fully available for students anytime that there's not any any um, faculty in it. So it's in our library, so it's open until midnight every, every day. Students go in there, um, kick back, they throw up some wireless content, and then they can write on the content as well as right next to it. And he's working on something there. So 
my question to you is, um, <laughs> should classrooms change? I mean, do, do we as, a, as an, you know, higher ed institutions need to be changing our classrooms into, into different modalities? Um, and in addition to that, has teaching changed? I know that our students have changed. I mean, you know, I love the copy and paste now because I remember when I used to get my papers back from the instructor with all these red marks on it, I had to go to my room with a typewriter and retype the whole paper from, from start to finish. Um, so I think things have changed as well as that, and the teachers have changed too. So um, a traditional classroom upgrade. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here. Is this, is this pretty typical in, in, inside of this? I mean, you can get by with it a little low. You, people are shaking their heads. No, not even close to that. Grand and a half. Grand and a half. <laughs> Um, but if, if, you're taking a, if you're taking a traditional classroom that's, that doesn't have any technology in it, and you're putting an extra on equipment in there, and you're switching, and you're putting the projector, and you're putting the screen, and you're putting all these other things into this classroom, you know, maybe you're up in that vicinity, maybe you're not. Um, but what you get for that is, is basically the screen mounted a teacher station, a room switching system, a control system, an audio system, and it's kind of built in. Um, and again, you know, it varies around price. So um, ours was, uh, this ended up around $13,000 um, for this classroom from, from the ground up. Um, and then if, again, if you're gonna add um, furniture into it, it maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and I'll just talk about what, what goes into that. Um, but I could take $13,000 and I, I could duplicate that around campus. That, that was something that was feasible for me to do. Um, so what I get for that, um, $13,000. Um, five projectors. Um, no front of room, no back of room. So we're, we're trying to develop a rooms that, that where the teacher's not focused up here. The teacher can roam the room. Um, there's not a station for the, for the teacher to be, to be held to. Um, so it is this flexible space. Um, and there's also a place where the students can't hide, right? Because <laughs> everyone wants to go into the back corner. Well, if the students walk in the room, they're like, well, I don't, you know, where, where can I go <laughs> where I'm not gonna be called upon? Um, and we use, uh, we use whiteboard idea paint around there. So again, <laughs> just so you know, about $13,000. Um, so they, now be aware of this, what, what's happening, what we're, what we're getting called to task is, when you take a traditional room that had nice rows of wooden chairs and you make it anything other than what it was, you're gonna lose space. Um, because you're going to some collaborative thing. You're going to tables and chairs, you're going to nodes, you're going to KIs, you know, learn tools, whatever you're going to do, you're going to lose capacity. And that's been a big issue for us on our campus because they're always like worried about capacity. The registrar says, and this room's 40, you can't be, you can't be making this room 28. That, that doesn't work. Um, we're trying to grow our school, not, not shrink our school. Um, and so that's a concern of mine. So the way you get around that is by taking out the teacher station, I'm gaining anywhere between 10 to 15 feet at the front of the room that was reserved just for the teacher. Like in this room, I mean, all this space up here is reserved for me to teach in, right? But if all of a sudden that's not there, I can stick tables in that space and I can have the teacher anywhere here. So I gain that space. By gaining that space, I can then add in larger chairs and keep the capacity at about the same, which is what we're doing. Um, the expectations of both students and faculty change. You walk into a room that's different, and they're expecting to be taught in a different way. Something exciting is going to happen today. And, and I don't know what it is, but this is a different room. It looks cool. So you, you better you know, step up to the plate to make it all happen. And so that, that's a little bit intimidating for faculty. Um, audio is obviously a problem. When you have a collaborative space, and you're having teams, and you have multiple projectors, what do you do with audio? How do you control that? How do you get one audio from one thing to the next? So that's always a concern when you're putting these things together. Um, and then the innovation from faculty. Um, you have to get faculty on board that they're going to teach different in this class. I mean, the last thing you want to do is build a really cool collaborative classroom, and you've got a, a teacher that walks in there and says, OK, everybody line up, and I'm going to stand right here, and we're going to teach the exact same way that I've always taught for the last 20 years. Um, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so you try to get a, around that and do different things. Um, so how often do you change out a room system? Anybody? You, you, just, you just finish the classroom, you upgrade the classroom, when are you gonna go back in there and just kind of remodel that classroom again? 
How long? Five years? Eight years? You do it every three years. That's impressive. Anybody else have any long, longer than that? <laughs> Is it working? <laughs> Come on, how many people still have VCRs in their classrooms? Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so how fun. So let's just say that's the truth. Um, let's just say it's seven years. Um, so that means if you do this classroom, it's going to be there in 2022. I mean, if you think about that, 2022. So if I'm, you know, the iPad's only five years old. That changed the whole revolution. The iPhones are like six or six and a half years old or whatever it is. I, I don't know what's going to be in seven years. But I want to be at least somewhat prepared for whatever's going to happen in seven years. And if you'd have told me that I could stream an, an HD Netflix movie to my, to my television 10 years ago, I would have laughed at you. You know, I'm doing 14.4, There's no way I'm going to get an HD. But that's changed everything. And so in seven years, it's going to be amazing. And I don't know what it is, but it seems to be going faster than anything. Um, so timing to me is everything. This is an ideal time to look, at, look ahead, figure out what's going on. The industry is changing around us and changing dramatically. Um, now you've got computers on, on HDMI sticks. You've got wireless keyboards and mouse. You've got all these wireless devices. You've got someone's going to figure out this Apple TV, Chromecast, whatever magic device that plugs in that does everything that we want it to do. It's, it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it is going to happen, I think, at some point in time. And so I'm trying to get us, let's be there so when that magic device comes out and I can just plug that HD thing, HDMI thing in, I'm good to go. And the thing what's happening right now is the analog subset just came, right? How many people are converting their rooms from, from analog to digital at this, at this point? And you have this combination, right? So this is, I think this is an opportunity right now to, to look at things and say, do we just take out this one extra on 406 or 304 and we stick in this 1608 and call it good? And now with the digital room, we run a few more cables, you know, we run a Cat5 and we're, we're good. Um, or is this an opportunity to look at the room and say, wow, can we really do something different here? Can we change this out? And can, we, can we create a different modality of learning? And start with somewhere and, and, then, and then move in that direction. Um, because wireless is coming, and it's not there yet. It's got some cool stuff, and it can untether people, and it can, you can get people around. Um, but I think it'll continue to just get better. And it's just going to be a, a couple years before you're going to see some amazing stuff happen. So building it, um, what we did is we put idea paint all around the entire room. So we took a room, and we used idea paint. Idea paint is basically 200 bucks for 50 square feet, so like a 5 by 10, which is about the same price as a nice whiteboard. The only thing is, is you use a lot more of this than you would a whiteboard. Um, but there's something innate about writing on the walls that, that makes things different for people. And maybe we've just all been told, don't write on the walls our whole life, right? That, that it becomes this unique thing. But, and students respond to writing on the walls like, like nowhere else. And even in this room, they've had people come in and you say, okay, I want you to break up into groups and I want you to write down your, your suggestions on this thing. So everyone's writing down there and then there's a teacher, I want you to read those back to me, right? If you tell us to take the same group, the same learning classes, we've done um, studies on this, and you say, instead of writing it down on a piece of paper, go and write it on the walls. So just get up, here's some, magic, here's some expo markers, go to the walls. And all of a sudden, the students they get better learning outcomes because the students are like, oh my gosh, look at Julie over there. They're, they're killing it. You know, I've got to get up to speed here. And so because it's visible to everybody, you get better content out of it. And it's just a difference of going from paper to a wall. I mean, the, the flatter the better, obviously, yeah. Um, we've had idea paint in this room for almost about three and a half, four years now. And um, you, if you go in there after, you know, after the end of the day when we wipe it all down, it looks like it's brand new. I mean, it's amazing. It has a lifetime warranty on it, and so we haven't had any kind of ghosting problems. And I, I haven't had any whiteboards on campus that can really say that. Um, so the, the, the kicker with idea paint is, is the application. Is you've got to be able to apply it right. So what I'm looking for is a really good painter. Anybody knows a really good painter? <laughs> um, because it's kind of nasty stuff going on, um, but it works amazing um, once you're up to speed. 
Um, what I did is I put these um, Enoch wall boxes in this um, company called Anthro out of uh, Portland, Oregon. These were made for um, medical, for um, bedside for doctors. So you walk into the room, you push on it, it flops, it flops down, you set your laptop on there and you assess the, assess the patient. Um, these have been great for a number of reasons um, because they're lockable. There's two, two separate areas. So I can have an area down below that I can lock things in. Um, I just put some basic Xtron switches in there. Um, there's wireless keyboards and mice that, that go into the side here. And down below in these things, um, I've got two Mac minis. So I've got Mac minis that, that drive both the projectors. But everything folds away. There's no, there's no um, umbilical cords, right? We've all known the umbilical cords from the, from the thing that go out. Nothing to trip on. It's not intimidating. If I close this thing up, it doesn't even look like anything. I mean, it sticks out from the wall this, this far. And so it's all folded away. You flop it down, you push the switch on and off, you've got some VGA inputs there, which you could change out to an HDMI input, and then you're good to go. And I put all the networking and stuff inside the wall there. Um, so again, those are fairly cheap, fairly inexpensive. Um, and then I'm using these, um, the bright links. Uh, what I like about the bright links, and especially on, on, a, on a wall, is I can go as big as I want. I'm not constrained by a board size. Um, also, you do it once, you don't have to calibrate it ever again. I mean, I haven't calibrated these things for, for three and a half years. Um, and so that's done. And if I need to change it out, if a new version of the Brightling comes out, and now it's widescreen, now it's HT, I don't, I don't have to worry about it. I just change out the projector, and I can go whatever dimension I want. I can go 1610, 169, 34. It doesn't matter. I can do whatever I want there. Um, and what I like about it is, you get projection, there's always a choice between faculty. Like, I want to project and I want a whiteboard, right? Well, why don't I give you both? You can actually write on your projection. You can, you can take your Expo marker and you can write on your PowerPoint. You don't need to learn any new technology. I mean, most people who, who have smart boards, what, what, what do they want to do? They want to annotate on top of whatever they're going to do. And smart boards can do all these cool things, but most faculty in higher, I don't have the time or the energy or the, or the willingness to learn all those things. So they do this. But everybody knows an Expo marker. You give them an Expo marker and just say, go at it. And the students can do this after hours um, as well as they want to as well. So this is kind of the room here. Um, and the funny thing is, is when I, when I did this, I tell the story is, uh, I had a vision. OK, this is what I want to do. I want to put this interactive room. I want to have movable tables and chairs. I want to do all these cool things. I'm going to put um, interactive projectors around the room. And so when they're not working, you've got everything else. And when they're working, you've got these interactive things. And you can group up into pods. And I'm an old AV guy. I've been doing this for a long time. You know, I wired up all the rooms. And so here I am crawling through the ceiling. Because somebody's in there like, OK, what if, I, what if I have content here? And I want this content to go over there. And this group was doing some really cool stuff. And we want to show what they're doing over here. And as, and as an instructor, maybe I want to control all the screens. So I'm like, well, I can solve that. You know, I, I've been down to Extron training. I can get me a big old switcher and put it on there and run some cables. So I'm running all these cables through the ceiling, cable after cable. And I had these big diagrams out on the, on the walls, figuring all this stuff out. And I step back one night. I'm like, this is crazy. What, what am I doing? This, this doesn't make any sense to me. And so I, um, I built this thing. This is a, actually a rack on the wall. And there's a, like a little room behind it. And I was going to run everything to this rack and do everything inside there. This is sitting there not hooked up. No, nothing goes to this rack. Um, it just, <laughs> it's just been there forever. Um, and I decided, you know, I don't need to do that because I can do what I need to do wirelessly. I can go from this. I can, as an instructor, I can walk into this room. I can sit down my Mac or my PC, and I can go wireless to every single projector in that room. As a student, I can take my Mac or my PC, mirror it up, and then throw it over there, wireless. I don't need to have this stuff. I don't need to have all this complexity. By taking out that complexity, I only saved a ton of money, because all that, all that equipment is expensive, right? And I can go to different places. And I give it flexibility, and I made it simple at the same time. There's not all these buttons for people to push. So I've taken out that whole learning curve. And the thing is for maintenance and upgrades and everything else that I need to do. So that's been a big deal for me. Um, the funny thing is, is I'll go back here. When I, when I, when I built this thing, um, let me show you one more time here. Um, I actually, 
I had three here. I have two, two 55 inch televisions on this side, because I was going to think, I'll, I'll do some video conferencing. That'll be cool. One screen and one screen. And then I put a projector in the middle. And I projected it on one wall, and I had a pull down screen. And I think it was the old AV in me, guy in me, that I, you know, I've done this in every single room for so long that I'm going to have a projector hanging from the middle of the ceiling, and I'm going to have a screen you can pull down. Um, and it wasn't until two years later, so this, this last summer, I went in there and I'm like, okay, I've got to get rid of this. So I took out the projector in the middle, took out the screen, and put two new Brightlink projectors on the, on the other wall. So now there's five projectors in that room. The two new projectors I put in there don't even have a computer attached to them. They're just projectors on the wall. And that's it. And then I've networked them, and then I put an Apple TV on the back of them. And so there's a lot of different Apple TVs in here. So there's five display devices in there right now, uh, five Epson Brightlink projectors, and there's actually two 55-inch televisions um, in that room. So again, you're looking at $13,000 because there's not a lot of cost here. Um, you know, these projectors are $1,500. And they're 3,000, 3,200 lumens, but you're, you're losing almost nothing because you're going almost straight down in a short throw range. Um, so you're gaining that. And there's only there's three computers in there now. Um, we use Epson EZMP um, a lot, so we've networked all the projectors. So with them, you can come in there and using Epson EZMP, you can mirror. We have students first the first time they come in as a class, we just install it on their computers, and they're good to go the rest of the semester. Um, no worries. They figure it out once, and it's not a problem. And the faculty member doesn't have to worry about it. She just comes in and says, hey, we're going to do collaboration today. Group A, you're right there. Group B, you're over here. And the students do it. And she becomes a moderator as she goes around the classroom. Um, and we use Apple televisions as well. Um, and we also use Doceri. Anybody, anybody use Doceri in here? As a way to remote control, annotate, um, do all kinds of things that way. Um, and Apple TVs. It worked good for us. Um, we've got it, we're on our network where you can authenticate and it knows that your faculty staff and it knows you can see the Apple TVs and things like that. Um, so that's been pretty, pretty nice for us. But we wanna, I want to get a solution for the, for the Android devices and all the Windows devices. Um, so I've got like AirTame and AirMedia and all these different things and Air Servers and Parrot and all these things that we're trying to try and out, figure out what we're doing. Um, but what's really important, it's funny that um, you know, these Epson, these bright links, these interactive projectors, you've all seen them with the pens, right? You can go on there and that's really cool. Um, but what I've seen in the three years since this room has been on board is that's, that's cool, but nobody really uses it, to be honest with you. What's more important that I felt was the fact that it's on a whiteboard and you can use an Expo marker on it. I see people using Expo markers way more than I see people using the interactive pens. In fact, I'll go in there, sometimes the pens are out of batteries and nobody ever told me anything. And that tells me that they're not even being used very much. So to me, the ability to project on a whiteboard is more important than the interactivity. And that may change once the new touch, the new Epsons are now touch sensitive. Um, so then I can use, just use my fingers. But I can still have that functionality by not changing anything. I put a brand new touch projector up on this wall, and I haven't changed anything else. But now I've got touch capabilities. And if you want to use touch, go ahead. If you don't, use, use your marker. I, you know, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, but it's all about the environment. You change the environment. You give them something that's collaborative, that's different, that they walk in there and they're like, wow, that's amazing. I can do something really cool in, in this space. Um, and that just generates different things. When I first designed it, I thought it would be used in a particular way. And um, it's not been the case. It's been used in all sorts of ways I've never even thought about before. And what's great about it is we've had all kinds of different disciplines come into it and figure out different ways. So we've had English come in there and do peer review. Um, we've had history come in there. We've had theology come inside there. And again, you've got the standard, the STEM classes, you know, the math and the sciences. They, they're like, oh, this is, I'm going to eat this thing up. No problem. You know, we're doing all kinds of science or math. That's a no-brainer for them. Um, here's an example of a peer evaluation. This is an English professor um, doing some stuff with some students. And again, she just walks around the room. <laughs> she doesn't even have to use the technology because the onus is then on the students. She turns the projectors on. And then, then the students do whatever they're going to do. And she, her focus is on teaching, was what it should be on, and not the technology. And so she gets to do some great stuff. So this is, um, this is kind of where it's at um, in the library. Um, it's this um, kind of light tannish room right there. 
There's an AV storage room next to it, and then actually my office is on the other side right there. Um, but it's been so successful. This is a couple years back, and we've actually replicated this room around campus um, a numerous, numerous times since then. And so we've got one in the education room, we've got one in, in the engineering, they've, they've loved it, and then we're kind of rolling some out um, around campus in different instances. Um, so it's really been a, a, nice, a nice thing for us. Um, and then I'm going to do one this summer. Um, we've got a large room in one of our buildings um, that look probably like similar to what that room I showed you earlier with the nice wooden chairs. Um, that I'm going to take, I'm going to put seven projectors in it. So I'm going to have seven display devices, um, whiteboard paint, and movable furniture. And the biology program is really excited about it. They're excited about the fact that you get a room that's just this collaborative space that you can do whatever you want to. And it's amazing how people want to meet in there for meetings. It's because it's, you call it a cool name or make something cool about it. Um, and you do something great. So, and I'm only going to have two, two computers in there. Um, I'm going to have one at the, at the front because sometimes faculty members, they're like, okay, I do want to teach something. I just need something at the front of the room or somewhere where I can direct people and that has a computer attached to it. So I'll give them that, no problem. I'll stick a Mac Mini in there. I'll stick an Intel stick in there. They've got computers coming on sticks. Um, you can use an iPad. You can use whatever you want. So I'll have that. I'll have two computers in there. The rest, I'm just going to have display devices. So I envision a room down the road where there is just display devices. Um, there's just display devices. And we just take whatever device that we have, whether it's a phone or a tablet or an Android, and you're going to connect to it. Uh, and uh, in, in faculty members are going to walk into the room, you know, connect up, we're going to teach, we're going to do some cool stuff. If you're doing the flipped classroom, this is ideal for that because you're taking that lecture point outside and when they get in the room, they're, they're doing hands-on projects and they're doing group projects and then you just say, move the furniture around, we're doing some cool stuff. So that's about all I have for that. I'm set aside a bunch of time for questions, so then hopefully you'll have some questions for me. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, Erlen. <laughs> Do you ever have connectivity issues with the Wi-Fi in those classrooms or around there? Um, surprisingly, our, our infrastructure is pretty robust. Um, and then we're, we're actually, because we're so small, um, we're actually under, under IT. So we have control. We can have some, some say in what the network does. And so we haven't had, do you know of any major problems? or? I just wanted to catch the catch box again, really. Uh, no, the, um, we hardwired the projectors to the network because those Epson projectors do have Wi-Fi in them, but we found that you want that endpoint to be hardwired. Even if I'm on the wireless network sending content to the projector, it works better if the projector's plugged in. So That's what we found out. Yeah, one side needs to be. So it's funny. I build all these wireless rooms, and I end up putting more drops in these wireless rooms to hardwire everything. But yeah. And we hardwire our Apple televisions as well. So both of those are hardwired and we go wireless to them. Yeah. How are you doing audio from the um, display devices and also are you doing audio for the instructors and for the students too? I mean audio has been an issue. Right now this classroom seats about you know, 28. Um, so you can get it into five groups of four, five or six groups of six, or whatever it is that you're going to do there. Um, as far as the audio, it hasn't been an issue in that room, because acoustics have been fairly nice. Um, there's always the audio from the projector. You get the nice little built-in speaker in the projector, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but but what, what, I'm, what I'm waiting for is there's enough Bluetooth devices out there now that I think I can build in some kind of a Bluetooth solution or some other solution that will help with everything through one location. Um, I've been kind of waiting on that. I'm hoping that's going to come down the pike. You had said that the students, when they go in there, it's, it's, a, it's a time for them to think, ah, oh, something great's going to happen. But you also kind of alluded to the fact that when the teachers go in there, they think, oh, I've got to do something great in here now. How hard was it to sell them on this idea? And it sounds like they're catching on now, but I, I have a feeling it wasn't uh, oh, yeah, it took, the easiest yeah. process to get them to go in there and start using it in this collaborative fashion. But yeah. how hard was it to train them to do that or to get them started on that? It, it took a while. Um, so initially, we thought, we're going to build this room. And um, it's going to be amazing, right? They're going to jump in there and do amazing things. And they're going to have all these great learning outcomes. And um, it didn't quite happen that way. Um, what we did say is we say we're going to set the room aside, so it's not going to be part of registrar enrolled room. But if you've got faculty that want to do a group project, so 
I'm doing this, doing this thing, and I've got a two-week project where we're going to do all this cool stuff. So I say, you know, stay in your room over there, bring your class over here for, for, the, for those two weeks, and we'll do something collaborative. So the onus is then, the teacher says, okay, I can, I can deal with this change in my pedagogy for two weeks, or a week. I can, I can, I can get, that's a small chunk. I can bite that off, I can figure something out, I can make that happen, and then I can go back to my, my comfort zone, you know, per se. And then they're starting to do that, but then they see the learning outcome, they see the excitement, and, the, and, the, and they're successful. We help them try to be successful in that. And then they come back, and they say, okay, now I'm gonna do it for three projects. And they keep going back and forth more. And so, so now we're starting a program where we wanna give incentives. Um, we've got enough faculty that know a little bit about it, know how to teach in it, are excited about it. So we're gonna give them incentives to um, take your whole class in there and shift your entire class. Because the last thing we wanna do is stick teachers in there and just have them teach the same way. If it was on the registrar's thing, then you'd get people in there just doing the same thing, so um, it's, it's, it's been a learning process for us. <laughs> so so uh, you talked about the resistance from the schedulers because of seating cap as being like, that's the thing that they attach a dollar amount to in school's business. How, what was your process to get them to buy in, to lose a few seats even though the idea of removing the teacher station was awesome? What do you do to, to deal with that resistance on campus and who do you partner with successfully to make that happen? Uh, for the resistance. Um, the nice thing is, is we, we, we partnered with the, um, the academic dean has, has really been on board and been a supporter of us as well as some of the some faculty champions, so, so to say. Um, so they've been really, really great. And then what's, as a side part about it, it's become like the major stop uh, on our tour of campus, right? So you bring your, you bring your prospective students through campus and oh, look at this cool, cool learning environment. You're gonna be able to do all these great things. And, and Ryan and I have a little song and dance uh, pony, dog and pony show that we do, you know, where we do a little pirate gag and we throw stuff up on the screen and record things. And, but stuff's flying everywhere and, and um, people get really excited about that. So the president's been a big proponent of it as well. And so that's really helped out because he's like, wow, okay, this is, this is something different that not a lot of folks are doing. And the thing is, is we brought in other K-12 schools. This is about three and a half years out now. Um, and it's been replicated in a couple other schools around, around Montana, and they've actually done studies where they've taken um, X class, was taught this way, and this semester we took them into this space, we taught the same class in this space. What were the learning outcomes? Did, did, did you see increased outcomes um, from students in, the, in that environment? And so far, the, the, the early data we've had has been positive. That's been, it's been great. Um, so I think we're continuing on. And this isn't the end all be all. I mean, I don't have all the answers um, by any means. It's something that I didn't just dream up one day. It just kind of morphed as I, as I went through it. Um, and it's continually to evolve. And like I say, I just you know, added two more projectors into there, looking to do something different. Um, and I think I'll actually pull some computers out and make it more. Um, but I, I think it's, we're a small enough campus. We've got some faculty that really uh, want to do some stuff in there. You mentioned the iPad initiative. Those are great to, for throwing content to these projectors. And if I can stick a, a little a PC on the back of a projector and just give them a wireless keyboard and mouse, I'm good to go. Um, it's good connected to, to the network. Um, so that's kind of the way I, I see it. But all this stuff is getting cheaper. I mean, the Intel 6 are a couple hundred bucks. The Chrome bits are $99. You know? So if you can solve some of those basic issues, um, and I think that the whole Apple television, Chromecast, Air Media, AirPlay, whatever it is, Wide eye, you know, mirror cast is gonna fall out in some way. If we had Chrome bits in that room instead of the Mac Minis, we would have saved several thousand dollars on the build, and the Chrome bit just plugs right into that HDMI and, and goes for it. So yeah. that's cool. Lessons learned. I had a lot of Apple devices in there. I use Mac Minis just because they're small profile, they fit perfectly in the, in the anthro box. Um, I had a lot of Bluetooth keyboards and mice, and they weren't sharing very well. So I actually took out the, the Mac uh, mice and just put some cheap Logitech ones in it. They've been great, so lessons learned. Yeah, so this is my dream classroom. This is exactly what we're trying to do on our campus. So I love seeing it. I would love your presentation also so I can share it with some of our IT guys if you're willing. I mean, I've already looked up your website and stuff. But my, we, we're trying to do this. We're, we take two steps forward, one step back, and it often comes to the capacity. So can you give me some exact numbers? Um, you know, what was the room capacity before? What was it afterwards? What were you able to make up? Yeah, no, definitely. That, that's, the new classroom learning lift actually has 50 wooden chairs in it. 
I mean, they're really tight. Um, and I'm like, how do you get 50 chairs in here? Luckily, I went to the registrar, and the registrar only shows 40 wooden chairs in there. So I was like, yes, <laughs> I've got 10 to play with. Um, so I, I am very keen on, on the capacity issues with the registrar issue. Um, so again, it, it's, it's not the end all be all, but you know, it, things just seem to work out with the give and take of space and different, and different things for me. So any suggestions that you guys have? I mean, I would love to hear from you guys that are doing some creative stuff. Um, and again, the one thing I'm looking at as well as, um, I like the projectors because I can still keep the whiteboard, but I'm always looking at televisions. You know, is the 70 inch television viable? Um, and maybe it's a touch screen 70 inch television. As they get cheaper and cheaper, maybe that's something that I could stick on the wall. Uh, again, I lose that whiteboard space that, that, that everybody so loves. But um, you'll keep it. It's kind of cool. We have students that go in there. We have one student that goes in there um, after after hours. He brings up the computer, brings up a YouTube video of a fireplace, and then just kicks back and with his paper and pencil, and just has the fireplace crackling on the screen. I mean, that's, that's all he does. So uh, it's used by all different ways. Um, but we'll go in there in the morning, and you'll see Ochem just written around the entire room. Um, and we've decided in, in our other study rooms, I'll show you some, I've got the pictures of the study rooms downstairs, we're just putting whiteboard paint in all these study rooms, and even around columns. If odd places, that's where the students write the, the most, if it's on a column. If you're a visual learner, you remember, oh, that's the column, it was in red, equal marker, I'm in the class, I can remember that chemistry problem, and I'm, I can relate to those things. They just get covered nightly. So that's been a big, big issue for us. Whiteboard paint's really been a, a, a big bonus for us. So I just want to say that uh, at Portland State, our School of Business did something similar, but ours wasn't wireless, so we had to do all this wiring. But someone, you were asking about the audio. We were going in there and to double check the HTCP compliance, we were showing a Blu-ray of, of the first Superman movie, you know, when Krypton is being destroyed and uh, Marlon Brando's going down with the ship. Yeah, and, and honestly, the audio out of those Epson projectors. Now, granted, this is a room that seated about 30 people, and they didn't, all the furniture was mobile, and the tables collapsed, and all that kind of stuff, but really, I was shocked that for Krypton being destroyed, it actually sounded pretty good. You know, you're never going to make someone go, oh, no, I'm not going to go build a home theater, but it was, it was completely sufficient for, for classroom needs. I was surprised. Yeah, and, and back, back to that, just real quick, if I can say something. Um, in this classroom, it's not designed to go in there and show a video. <laughs> and I want you sitting in the high-tech classroom showing a, showing a video. So if you can show a video, it's going to be a short little YouTube video for a couple minutes, and then the audio is fine. Now, we, we did do a classroom, and I sold them on the idea of, yeah, the audio will come out of the projector, everything will be fine, and yeah. Somebody found some YouTube clips where the audio itself wasn't great, and it's obviously the projector, so we had to take that audio out and put an amp into the room. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you guys coming out. Um, you know, if you have any questions, we'll be around.